Thank you. Uh, thank you for that warm welcome. I appreciate it. But uh, it has nothing to do with me. It's all about God, and God used you all and, and countless other people to pray. And uh, for some reason, I told my church the first Sunday I was back, I said, I said, heaven wouldn't take me, and hell was afraid I'd take over, so they sent me back here. <laughs> and uh, so I don't know what all God's reasons were, but he, he let me live another uh, almost year now. Uh, next the 8th of February will be a year, and uh, so that's wonderful, and I'm thankful. But my name's Randy, and uh, I had a heart transplant, and that's what Rod wanted me to come and tell you, so thank you all, all right? And uh, we'll see you next time I'm here. But... Uh, <laughs> Now, uh, Kathy and I, he introduced my wife for me. We are high school sweethearts, and uh, I was in 12th grade, and she was in 8th grade. And, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> and uh, we did start dating our senior year in high school, and uh, she went to, uh, she's from Pennsylvania. Don't hold that against her, uh, but uh, her, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh, her dad is about four feet tall and four feet wide. He's a Dutchman, and uh, he, he's built like a stump, and uh, it kind of looks like one, and uh, stubborn is one, too, but he, uh, so I had to ask this little short fat dude if I could marry his daughter, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm 19 years old asking this guy if I can marry his 18-year-old daughter, and uh, and he said, well, Randy, he said, you know, her finishing her college is very important to us. And I said, that's very important to me, too, because you'll be a nurse. You'll make me a lot of money. But anyway, and uh, so I, I promised him. I said, I promise you that uh, that will happen. And it did. And I never called him once and asked him for a dime. And uh, I just stole money from people I could find. But anyway, and so he... Uh, so we got through all that, and then we uh, had kids, and that was so much fun. We just kept having them. But uh, so we ended up with four kids. We now have eight because they all got married, and, and uh, I view my in-laws as my own children, my in-law children. They're my, so I have four sons and four daughters, and uh, it's awesome, and uh, we have a great time. We have four grandchildren, as Rod said, one on the way. Uh, we have three boys uh, first, and then we had a little girl and uh, this new one's going to be a little girl. And, uh, and I mean, how many of your grandparents? Anybody here? Grandpa? Yeah, I want to tell you, there's nothing better. Uh, it's just, it's awesome. And in fact, if you don't, if, in fact, if you haven't had kids, don't have them. Just have grandkids, okay? It's a lot more fun. And uh, I've not changed one diaper. Yeah, I take it back. I have changed one diaper, I think, out of almost five grandkids. So I love that. And, uh, but it's awesome. But anyway... So I, I love my family, and uh, some reason they act like they love me. But, um, but anyway, uh, that's just a little bit of who we are and where we come from. Uh, but when Kathy and I were in high school together, it was our senior year we met. Uh, I was going to a private Christian academy that offered boarding. And so she was such a troublemaker at home. Her parents sent her all the way to South Florida to boarding school. And uh, I met her there. And I lost my heart when I met her and got to know her. And I asked her out one night. I remember the first time I asked her out, I pulled my fancy car. I, I worked hard and made good money in high school. And uh, so I had a really nice car, a beautiful car. And I remember I, I saw her. She was on her way to the girls' dorm. And I, I pulled my car off the road and I got out. And it was kind of a sandy lot there where, where I was parked. And she came walking by. I said, Kathy, you know, and you got to be cool when you're in high school, you know. And so... I'm standing there all cool, calm, and collected. It had been raining a little, so it was kind of sandy and, and, you know, sticks to your shoes a little. And she comes up, she gets, stops by, and I said, hey, I said, I, I was going to ask her out. Well, instead, I stepped on her foot. And uh, so I then asked her out. She felt sorry for me, said okay. And then after that date, I, I asked her for a second one. She said, I don't want to date anymore. And so she, instead, she decided to start dating my best friend. My ex best friend, okay, and so, uh, but uh, but I, I you got to understand something. When I want something, I'm going to get it, okay. Uh, whether Jesus helps me or not, I'm going to get it. And uh, and I wanted Kathy, and I I married her, and so he and I are good friends again. But anyway, um, you know, it, it was just a, it was one of those things that I and and she I've still lost my heart. 
And everything I went through over the past two years has grown that love of mine for Kathy tremendously because God gave me, he knew back in high school my future. He knew who I was going to need, and he directed my heart to fall for the right person. And, and that's the amazing thing about God. He has, he has you in mind and what is best for you in mind. And so we say, well, why do I suffer if God has what's best for me in mind? Because God doesn't play favoritism. And uh, I just so happened to get the wrong dad, okay, who had horrible genetics when it came to heart. And, uh, and it's infected the Addison family for, for generations. And uh, I am now the third, third generation of people who, who uh, have either suffered severely or have died with heart disease at early age. And, uh, and I beg God to allow it to end with my generation, to end with me. And, uh, and, and I don't know if God will listen to that or not, but I still beg him and ask him for that. And... Um, and so it's not that God was cruel to me, that I had a heart that Dave gave out. It was, and, and, and we forget that when we're going through that sometimes. And I remember my card, one of my cardiologists, it was their transplant team doctors, and, and he was in my room, and he was telling me one. He said, man, Randy, he said, you've been through it. He said, I'm so sorry for you. And I looked at him, I said, I, and it took me a long time to get to this point. It took me years to get to this point. And uh, I looked at him, I said, but why wouldn't it happen to me? And he just kind of shook his head. And he couldn't grasp that type of thinking. But God got me to that point finally where why would I be so special that I wouldn't suffer? And I don't know. Some of you are probably going through some really uh, hard things physically right now yourself. Uh, I met a dude here this morning, and, and he's a, he had a heart transplant back in May, and, and, and it's awesome. And, and, uh, and it's exciting. I mean, he's my brother, and we never even met before, but, but there's a bond there that, that you have to go through what I'm going to talk about this morning. So anyway, I just want that out that, that you know, there's nothing to feel sorry for me about, nothing. Uh, this, that just happened to be my thing in life I've had to deal with. Uh, but when I was about 27 years of age, I was pastor in Pennsylvania, and, um, and I... And I began to have heart attack symptoms. And I remember one night I was in a church board meeting. And, if, and, and that church, for some reason, I don't know if it was all because they're a bunch of Yankees or what, but they were hard to get along with. And, uh, and, and so I was in there. And I'm the kind of guy, you know, that I always thought the church was for everybody. Don't you think so? I think church for everybody. And, uh, and so I, I was just dumb enough to, to believe that. And, uh, and they wanted it to be a club. And I remember one night in board meeting, and I finally told them, I said, well, guys, if this is how we really feel, let's all walk outside to the church sign afterwards. Let's take the name church off and put Evangelical Christian Club on it. How's that? And maybe a little smart aleck comment, I don't know, but I was still a kid, so you can get away with that. But I began to have heart attack symptoms. I remember one night after board meeting, uh, some of the board members, I just told them what I was feeling, and they said, you better get to the emergency room. And so one of them went with me out to the emergency room, and I went in, and, and uh, they basically look at you and tell you you're too young to have heart disease. I was about 26, 27 years old. And uh, so they, they were kind, kept me overnight, and then sent me home the next day, followed up with a cardiologist, and, uh, and he said, you're too young. You don't have anything wrong with your heart. And I ended up back in the emergency room. They're telling me the same thing again. And finally, one cardiologist had enough discernment that he was he is what he told me he said I want to follow up with you in the in my office and so we did and he he wired me up to some stuff and I wore that for a while and it it showed that there was an actual heart problem you talk about some attitude changes with doctors that began to happen very quickly and so they began to treat for thank you I appreciate that I have a I have an athletic nose. It just wants to run all the time. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so, so, uh, so they began to treat that, and that wasn't used, was it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. I love Annie. You know, my mom loved Annie. She loved her. And, uh, and so anyway, I was... Uh, I was uh, you know, being treated for that and everything, and things began to deteriorate. Uh, and so I, I took a smaller church in, in rural Alabama, 
and a lot less stress, and and they were nice people, and uh, and I I I. I while I was there, they came out with some new medications that my cardiologist said, Randy, I think this will help. And he started me on it, and it did. It helped. I improved. I showed tremendous improvement. And uh, it kind of halted and reversed some of the symptoms. And so for about 10 years, I, I had some pretty good years in there. And then I, and then I um, you know, uh, came to North Carolina, and, uh, or moved to North Carolina, and uh, took a church there, and I was getting up in my 40s, and, um, and so I was beginning to do a little aging, and the heart began to wear out, and I had to get a, um, about eight years, eight, nine years ago, I had to get a, uh, a pacemaker, and then I wore a pacemaker for a while, then I had to get a defibrillator uh, slash pacemaker, they called it an ICD, and um, some of you may wear one of those this morning, I don't know, but uh, if you have one, it's an internal uh, defibrillator, and and uh, and when your heart goes into certain rhythms, it'll shock it. It'll shock you out of that, and uh, and so after you change your pants from that, uh, you you go on and live. But uh, it's quite an experience, I'll tell you. It is that, and you will never forget it. And uh, so mine started going off one night. I was in the hospital with pneumonia because my heart was getting so bad, so weak. I just kept retaining fluid, retaining fluid, retaining fluid. And um, <clears throat> so I'd end up with pneumonia, go in the hospital, they'd get, me, get that cleared up, send me home. I'd, I'd go a while, then I'd get pneumonia again and go back into the hospital. And that was repeated a few times. And uh, one night I was in with pneumonia, and the defibrillator started firing and would not quit. And I remember... One of my very last memories of that night was they grabbed my bed and they were running down the hall toward the ICU. And I woke up six days later and, um, and I, I, I remember waking up, my son was with me, and he was saying, Dad, he says, you have been asleep. He said, they've had you out for months he said, and we've elected, and he named the person that I was vehemently against becoming president. <laughs> My immediate thoughts were, God, let me die. <laughs> and, uh, and fortunately, he was just yanking my chain. I'd only been out for six days. But, you know, I was, I was you know, I remember coming out of that, and, and, and I and, and 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 it was so surreal. But then this fear began to set in. And I remember one night my brother Rick was sitting with me, and I, I wouldn't sleep. I wouldn't sleep. Some nights had gone on, and I would not sleep after they brought me out of that, uh, off of that life support. And and I I couldn't sleep. And finally he began to question me. And he said, Randy, why will you not sleep? And I remember I broke down. And I said, Rick, because I'm afraid I won't wake up. Because I knew I was in bad shape. I knew that. You know, you can just instinctively pick some things up. And so things began to deteriorate. And they said, Randy, you're going to have to have what we call, you're going to have to have a heart transplant. But because you are an O, o uh, positive blood type, or O negative, because you're O negative, that's a very common high demand blood type. They said, and, and a heart, that heart is in too high demand, and you will not live long enough to get one. And so they said, the other option we have is, they said, we can give you a, an LVAD, which is a left, uh, it's a left assist uh, device, and it helps the left ventricle of the heart pump. And actually, it takes over and pumps for it. It's all it requires open heart surgery, and uh, and then they they run a cord out of your side, and uh, it's hooked to a, to a uh, to a some kind of electronic device that's powered by big batteries, and you wear it all, and uh, and that pumps the blood in your heart for you, and they they and they put the pump inside your chest, and then 
all the externals, the batteries, and the controller. And you have this big cable like that coming out your side. And uh, <clears throat> I said, I don't want that. And, uh, and they understood that, but they also understood I had to have it to live. So, I've, so I agreed. I counted the, counted the cost, and, and, and that person hadn't been elected yet. So, you know, and, or actually never was elected. But anyway, and, and, so I, and so I said, okay, we can do it then. You know, it's, it's worth living now. But anyway, I... Uh, so we did that in March of 2016, and um, and I woke up from that surgery, and um, and it was an open heart surgery, and now I have this extra equipment I have to live with. You sleep with it, you bathe with it, you 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 everywhere you go, it goes with you. It's hooked to you, and if it comes unhooked, you die. And it, seriously, that's what you die, and. Uh, and so we talked about maybe getting a puppy about that time. And then I got to thinking, puppies like to chew. And I have that electric cord coming out. And so I, I said, I think we're going to put the puppy off. And, uh, and so we did, and we still are. And, uh, and so we just babysat our daughter's dog from hell. But anyway, so we got our fill for that. <laughs> and, uh, and so... And so I wasn't going to get it because, you know, it was like, man, I, you know, my wife wouldn't let me trim the hedges or anything because she, I use an electric one. She could just see that thing, boom, right through it, you know. And she found out I didn't have as much life insurance as she thought I did. So she said, uh-uh, I'm trimming the hedges. And, and so she said, you're still worth some money because you bring home a paycheck. So, so it, but it was kind of nice. I didn't have to trim any hedges. I still mowed the yard. But, but, she, but so anyway, we get through all that. And I go January the 4th I, of, of 2017, a year ago. I go in. They were going to start because I was getting in such bad shape They because uh, the pump had stopped. It just wasn't being effective. It was working, but it wasn't being effective. I still was getting sick, and, and I was just on a fast decline. And so they're going to start me on a medicine called Primacore. And uh, Primacore is, is, is rocket fuel for the heart is what it really is. That's, how, that's the slang term the doctors will use for it. And, uh, and so, and I'd been on it before, and it really does help. And so I went in the hospital for that. I was going to have to spend one or two nights. One of my transplant team doctors walked in, and he looked at, he took one look at me. And he said, you're going nowhere till you get the heart. And so January 4th, 2017, I became a resident of 1000 Blythe Avenue, Charlotte, North Carolina, in Dixon Heart ICU. And when you're in the ICU for heart, you have no freedom. You have no liberty. You're tethered to the room. Seriously. And now I know why, now I know why dogs that are chained up are mean. I mean, that's cruel. I could get to the door and I would stop. I have these cords, you know. They do. So I got up in my room and I, I adjusted some things around so that I could get a few, another foot or two of cord, so I could get actually to the door. And I would push my chair over to the door and I would sit in it and I'd watch people go by the hall. And this one guy came by and he he was another guy having to live in there waiting for a heart. And, uh, I mean, it's like death row, you know, you're sitting there in death row, you know, and it's like, okay, you're still living, aren't you, you know, and, and, uh, and in fact, I lived in ICU so long, I finally forgot why they called ICU, you know those gowns? <laughs> I thought we had a bear loose in there one morning, until I just realized there's a lady next door that hadn't shaved her back. So I thought I would help him out. I wore mine backwards. <laughs> but I was tethered to my room like a dog. And then every day they come by, they take you for a walk like your dog. I looked all over that stinking hospital for a fire hydrant, and there wasn't a one. 
So I just started using my nurse's leg. <laughs> it worked. And, and talk about dog. I mean, the food tasted like dog food. I thought my wife had got confused and put me in the local dog kennel. And I mean, it was horrible. And, and, and you know, and so, you know, it was just one of those things, you know, you, you're weak, you're sick, you know you're dying. And, and then, you know, you can't get out and move around as you want. You know, they treat you like, you know, hey, number 12, you gone for your walk yet today? You know, and, and it's like, you know, no, you lie and tell them no so you can get out of your room again for the day, you know. Not really. They, they were nice. They were kind. They were I, had, I had some of the best nurses in the world. And, and even if one of them was, a couple of them were really pretty, too. One was a former NFL cheerleader, and, and, uh, and she fit the bill pretty good, you know. And, and she took a real liking to my brother Rick. I don't know what he had. I didn't, other than health. But anyway, um, but she really took a liking to him. And uh, Rod, she never seemed impressed with. But anyway, <clears throat> but I remember there in ICU, I got so sick, I was, I was literally dying. My body was shutting down to die. And the doctor came into my, wife, into my wife and he said, Kathy, he said, I have one more trick up my sleeve. And he said, if this doesn't work, he said, I, I'm, I've hit a wall. He said, there's nothing else I can do. Well, the trick up his sleeve was, was to put an RVAD. He already had the LVAD, the left ventricle pump assist device. He wanted to put a right one. Now, I knew what a right one was. I knew you would never leave the hospital with a right heart VAD, an R VAD. I knew you don't. You, you have to always live in the hospital with that until you die or if you get a heart. And, and I knew it was going to require a second open heart surgery that I'd already had one less than a year before. And so I know they're going to do a second one. And I thought... Then the problem, and I was afraid it would de delay me getting a heart because I thought I'd have to heal for six months from that one before they could open me up again, which I, I found out later I was misunderstanding on that. And I told them, I don't want it. I don't want it. And, and they, they showed me this little device that was an external one that they were going to start with. I said, I'll do that. But I was so out of it. I, I couldn't, I couldn't focus. And they put me back on life support, put me back in that coma stuff, whatever they do, and they put you on life support. And I remember coming out of that, and he told her, he said, he said, I'm going to give them, I think it was a half hour or an hour. He said, if something doesn't happen, he said, I'm going to have to do that. And if that doesn't work, I'm done. I have nothing left. And she interpreted they were going to let me go home and die. And up to that point, I hadn't really opened up publicly of where I was at physically. But at that point, I told Kathy, I said, you can tell the kids and put it on social media. Because after a while, you get tired of all the attention. And I was at that point, I was sick of it. I was sick of answering questions. I was sick of, you know, praying for you. You know, oh, you know. I, I, it's terrible sometimes, but it's just like, I want left alone. If you're going to pray, do it. Just don't tell me. And that sounds so ungrateful. But you have to understand, people care so much, and, and they want to pray, and they want to let you know they're praying. But after a while, it's like, I'm tired of the You just want to crawl up in a shell and just be left alone and die. If that's what it, if that's what it was going to be. And that's where I was emotionally right then. I was in a dark, dark spot. And I told Kathy, I said, tell the kids they can let people know and ask for prayer. So I had a half hour, and they were going to do something major. And she did. And within moments, I'm telling the truth, right? Within moments, the doctor would come back in the room. He'd say, something's happening. And he'd go out, and he'd come back and say, something's happening. Because people were praying. I didn't have to have that surgery. I didn't have to have it. But I remember coming out of that coma that they'd put me in on their life support. And I was so sick. And it may be a different time than that. I don't remember. After a while, it all runs together. And I, and I remember coming out of that, and I'm like, and I'm like, 
I was, I was so sick. I looked at Kathy. I could talk. I still had a tube down my throat, but I could clunk through clenched teeth like this, and she could understand. And I looked at her, and I said, I want to die now. Scared her to death. She thought I would lost my will to fight, and I had. I had. I have to admit, I had. But that was a dark spot because the pain, the suffering, and, and, and the fears, all of it kind of comes together. I'd never been that miserable before. It was absolutely horrible. Kathy has since regretted not letting me die, but but anyway, she uh, she because uh, she found out I actually did have the insurance money she thought I did. But anyway, I uh, you know I just didn't want to know some of that stuff at first. But so anyway, but here's what I want to here's what I want to really leave with you. Those are just that's part of my journey. It was long. It was 27 years long. The journey was uh, because I got a, I, I was diagnosed with. Uh, cardiomyopathy, which is the heart disease I had. I was diagnosed with that when I was around 26, 27. And I got my heart when I was when I was just turning, a week before I turned 54. So half my life I struggled with that. And, um, and so it was a long, long process, and I've condensed it all down into that. I'll never forget the evening that it was after hours, and I'd ask around. I, I was I was kind of guy, I like information. I don't like to be left in the dark. I like information. So I asked questions. And I'm living there. I said all the time in the world, ask all the questions I wanted. And I remember asking the nurses, how will I know when they come in my room and they're going to tell me they have a heart for me? And the nurse told me that it'll be a couple of them from the transplant team. They'll come in together, and they'll tell me together. It's after hours, and the, which you don't see transplant people after hours. And it was after hours, and I, and I, uh, the the door opened, and then walked a nurse and a PA from the team. And they shut the door behind them, and I knew. And uh, it was about 6.30, I think, in the evening, if I remember correctly. Kathy was there. One of our daughters was there. And they said, we have Dr. Gilotti on the phone. I don't know what happened to Dr. Smith, Dr. Jones. But I had Dr. Gilotti. I had Dr. Mahmood. When he wasn't around, I called him Dr. Moo Moo. And uh, I really did. I mean, it was just, it's like, man, what happened to, you know, Anyway, so, uh, so you know, I, I expanded my knowledge of, of languages. But anyway, uh, so Dr. Galati's on the phone. He said, Randy, he said, we have a heart for you. He said, I think it's an awesome fit mix. He said, I feel like it's a perfect heart. And, uh, and, and I don't share this. I, you know, I, I just don't normally share this a lot. But, but, you know, I don't mind sharing it this morning. I'm, I've gotten real comfortable with it. He said, but it is a high-risk heart. I'd prayed two things. I'd prayed first that I wouldn't have to live in the hospital. God blew that one away. I'm living in the hospital. I'd also prayed that I would not receive a high-risk heart. He ignored that, too. I said, well, how's, how's high-risk? How? He said, you have an intravenous, he said, it's an intravenous drug abuser's heart. They'd probably OD'd. But intravenous, that means they use needles. It means it's high risk for disease. I said, I said, Dr. Gilotti, I said, let me talk to my family about it. I'll get right back with you. Nurses stepped out. Kathy and our daughter was there. We sat down. We talked about it. I personally felt kind of like God had let me down. Felt, I kind of felt like he let me down when I had to live in the hospital. Kind of felt like he was letting me down right then with giving me you know, them throwing this heart at me that's some drug abuser's heart. 
And I knew they'd tested the heart. I, I knew everything the heart had to go through before they'd even consider it. I knew that. So I knew it was a clean heart. But I also knew that there were 72 hour, there was a 72-hour window where it could have been contaminated and it wouldn't show up. The prior 72 went hours. I knew all that. I said, Kathy, Megan, as your youngest daughter, I said, that's what you guys think. I said, Dad, you know, I said, you need to take it. Because they, they understood better than I did that I was dying. And I said, you know, guys, I said, and I'd quiz the doctor on the phone. I'd ask him. I'd said, I said, let me, let me ask you this. I said, if I were your brother, would you offer me the heart? He said, to start with, you'd be my much older brother. So he had a good sense of humor. He said, but absolutely. He said, I wouldn't doubt for me. He said, this is an incredible heart. And so I talked to Kathy and Megan, and I said, what do you guys think? They were all for it. I said, you know, I said, we've asked, you know, I said, we, feel, we, we felt so confident with our medical team. I said, we feel, like, we feel like God has given us this team. They're recommending it. I said, these are areas that we don't fully understand, but they do. I said, they're recommending it. I said, why don't we just continue following their direction? We felt like God had put them in our lives. So we were all in agreement. We took it. They tested everything two months later. Everything's still disease clean. Tested it six months later. Everything's still disease clean. There's no concern, no worries ever about it. I have a good, clean, healthy heart that beats like a sledgehammer. <laughs> My donor was a, was a, that's all I know about them. But my donor was a multi-organ donor, and the heart's the last organ they can take. So I had to wait till the next day to have my transplant because they were keeping the donor's body alive till they could retrieve all the other organs that were being donated. And so the next, around 2 o'clock, I think, in the afternoon it was, I believe, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they came to my room and they got me. And my oldest daughter, Kristen, had gone to K-Love, a Christian, I think you guys, I'm sure, have it around here probably, Christian radio station. She'd gone to their web page that morning, uh, the morning of my transplant. <clears throat> and they had a verse of the day that they had posted. And it was Ezekiel 36 and, and verse 26. And it just simply says this, I will give you a new heart, And put a new spirit in you. And then God had a word for my brother Rod. It said, I will remove, I will remove from you your heart of stone. <laughs> that was for you, that was for you, Rod. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. That's the day of the transplant. Don't tell me there's not a God. Don't tell me there's not God that wasn't aware. Yeah, I felt like he wasn't listening and whistling Dixie instead of listening to my prayers about living in the hospital and getting a, getting a high-risk heart. I didn't feel like he was aware of any of that, basically. I felt like he'd let me down. But he was keenly aware. He knew exactly what my family needed that day. And I want to share just a few things about that scripture. The first is, I thought God would let me down. But God was keenly aware. See, this was a time when Israel had wandered far from God here in Ezekiel. And they, over the several previous several years, uh, the, you know, they'd wandered far, far from God, and God's calling them back. And he's assuring them of being restored and delivered from their oppressors. And it's a time of restoration in their life, in Israel's life. And he's telling them, I'm going to remove that old heart of stone of yours. I'm going to put a heart in you that's fresh and that's new and one that of flesh that welcomes my spirit. And he's promising them the, these things. And, and in verse 15, he tells them, no longer will I make you hear the taunts of the nations and no longer will you suffer the scorn of the peoples or cause your nation to fall, declares the sovereign Lord. 
Why? God had heard. He was aware of the suffering of his people. Although I felt God had let me down by, by putting me in the hospital, and, and I felt like God had let me down by giving me a heart that wasn't perfect like I wanted it to be. He was aware of what my true needs were. God wanted me to live in that hospital for a purpose. And every day I tried to find that purpose. It seemed I, I wanted to be an encourager. I wanted to be someone who cheered others up. I wanted to help others. And, you know, God opened those doors. I wanted to be a witness for him, and he opened those doors. And, and, and I made wonderful friends in there, wonderful friends. I go back, and those nurses see me. They, they are so excited to see me, and I'm excited to see them, especially that cheerleader. And I, and I just, I, you know, it's just great. Oh, I'm messing with you. But, you know, God had a purpose. One of the nurses told me, she said, Randy, she said, before you came, she said, before you came, she said, I was ready to throw in the towel and walk out of this place. She said, but I have a whole different perspective of coming to work now. Why? Because God, for whatever reason, wanted to use me to bless some other people. And that's why he had a bigger plan than mine. He had a bigger plan than mine. I just had a nurse tell me just last week. I was in overnight last week. They're running some tests on me. And, and, uh, and she told me, she said, Randy, before you came here, with the, when I was so sick and everything, she said, before you came here, she said, she said you changed me when, I, when you came here to visit and to stay. She said, something happened. And it's awesome. I had a doctor. One of my doctors told me, he said, Randy, he said, he said, I'm not a praying man, but I was so sick. And I was so sick when I was living there. I see, he said, I'm not a praying man. He said, but I prayed for you last night. I said, Doc, that's interesting. I'm a pastor, and I appreciate that. And he teared up. He said, I'm going to pray for you again tonight. So I'm going to say a prayer of thanks tonight. You know, I didn't know any of those things would happen. I don't know what's still going to happen from it all. But I know this, God was aware that I could still be of use to him there. The other thing is that when God moves on my behalf, God deserves to be praised. And I prayed that just sitting right there in that seat before I came up here, that God would be glorified through whatever it was, that he'd use me however he wanted this morning to be glorified. God doesn't want to just bless us, but he desires for us in turn to bless him by giving him all the praise. I have nothing to do with being healthy and standing here before you this morning. I know, that's all God. And I would tell my doctors, because I would tell them, because some doctors struggle with the whole faith thing. Not all doctors, but some do. And so I figured out a way to get through to them. I'd said, you know, doctors, I, I, tell, I don't know how many doctors I told this to, because I had, I had a plenty of doctors. And I, I would tell them, I'd say, you know what? God created science, but God gave you the ability to understand it in such a way that you're able to help me. And they connected with that. And they connected with that. And, and, and you know what? I was able to praise God with that and be a witness to others with that. And, 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 and so, you know, it wasn't just so I was blessed, but I had to live there so he could be blessed. Verse 22 says, Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says, It's not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you've gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. The name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. God's ultimate purpose is to be blessed by restoring us to a right relationship with him. God did not heal me through heart transplant for me. He didn't do it for me. He did it because he wasn't through with using me to bring him praise and him glory. That's why he did it. That's exactly why he did it. It had nothing to do with me. It was all about, he says, I'm not quite done with that guy. 
I'm not quite finished. I still have a purpose. I still have a plan for him. And as, my, my firm belief is this. As long as you have air in your lungs and you have your sane mind, God is still using you. He's still using you. He has plans for you. And even if you're not sane mind, I've never been sane mind. He still used me. And I, I, I sometimes lament to my wife. I said, honey, I just don't think like normal people. And, but yet he uses me and he uses people. And that's why we breathe today. That's why we live today is for God. It's not for our pleasure. It's not for us. It's not about us. It's for his glory. It's for his purpose. It's for his plan. That's why we live. God's ultimate purpose is so that we can have that right relationship. It has, it's his biggest plan for us is that he will give us a new heart. He says in verse 24, For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. Now this is a people who've wandered far from God. He says, And you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. I had three open heart surgeries in 11 months. Actually, it was 10 and a half months. I had three open heart surgeries. Two back to back. When I got my heart transplant, they left me partially open because when you've had the heart pump, the LVAD, like I'd had, there's excessive bleeding normally. And, there, and that proved to be true in my case. So he had to go back in through what he'd left open and fix a bleed. Then he closed me all the way up. And then that night, my wife got the call, said they're going, Randy's going back in for another open heart surgery. He has a bad bleed. I'd lost half my blood count and never woke up from the first one. And this is like within 24 or 36 hours of the transplant to doing this. So he goes back and he opens it all the way up again. That's my third open heart surgery in 10 and a half months. And he goes in, he fixes it, and closes me back up. But here's what they tell me happened when he did the transplant. He took this heart from a dead person, and he has it in the operating room with him. His name is Dr. Skipper. He's God's, one of God's greatest gifts of mankind in my life. He's done all three of my open heart surgeries. <clears throat> I told him the other day, I saw him, and I said, I said my chest isn't open. I said, you probably don't recognize me or something along that line. And, uh, but he said, and so I, <clears throat> so they tell me is what he did. He took my old heart out, my old heart he removed. And he came in, talked to my family afterwards. And he told my wife, he said, when I took his old heart out, his original heart, he said it was so diseased and enlarged with disease. He said that his heart cavity was expanded so far. He said that when I put the new normal size heart in, he said it looked like a baby's heart I was putting inside his chest. And then this is what they tell me he did. I was there, but I don't remember. They said he reached inside my chest with his hand. And he began to massage life into that lifeless heart that he had just put in. It wasn't beating on its own yet. It had been on ice. They said he reached his hand in there and he began to massage it. And as he massaged it, it began to pump. And as it pumped, it became warm. And it became pink. And it became alive. And I just can't help but believe that God has that same kind of transplant for every one of us. That God wants us to be laid open bare before him. Where we take all the pretenses off. Where we quit pretending to be godly. 
where we could quit pretending that everything in our life is right. And we can just be honest. And we can just bear our soul to God and say, God, you know those secret sins I have. God, you know those things in my past that I've never owned up to. I've never made right. And God, the whole time, he's saying, you're right. You're right. He says, the more you open yourself up to me, he says, the more I can massage myself into you. The lie of my life of holiness, my life of godliness, my life of selflessness, and, and my life of, of sacrificial giving, and my life of love, and my life of forgiveness. And he wants to massage all that into every one of our hearts. Because every time he puts a squeeze on my heart, massages more of himself into me, I become more Christ-like. And that's God's ultimate goal in every one of our lives today. He wants to do a transplant on every one of us. And I think it's incredible that we serve a God who is so aware of where we are. And he loves us so much that he could care less what our past is. He doesn't even care what you're dealing with right now in the sense of holding it against you. He cares, but he's not going to hold it against you if you'll just open up and tell him. He's already got the glove on. Says he wants to reach inside you and he wants to touch your heart and he wants to massage his love, his forgiveness, his righteousness, his godliness. He wants to give it to you. My surgeon, Dr. Skipper, one of God's greatest gifts he's ever blessed me with, reached his hand in and he massaged new life into this old tired, worn out, and lifeless body. And I breathe today because he massaged me to life. And God wants you to breathe in him.